All right, today we're going to finish up most of our unit on control. This actually, hopefully we'll finish it today. This actually will finish up the last unit of the course, uh, the last main unit of the course. And the rest, last two classes are going to be sort of special topics. And we're going to spend a lecture on, on uh, a topic here or there. And then we have sort of a final lecture or two for the, for the last day of class. Um, but the basic idea here is that uh, we've covered two settings so far, where two stochastic settings where optimal control is still, is still possible, right? We talked about the linear quadratic Gaussian case where we know we can solve the situation exactly using uh, LQR. That's one case that we can solve exactly. The second case then is the MDP. And the MDP, as I said, covers kind of uh, arbitrary stochasticity in the, in the dynamics, but uh, is limited in that it can only naturally handle, at least only easily handle, domains with finite numbers of states and actions. That's sort of the, the way you, you handle that stochasticity is you just ex represent everything explicitly and, and you know, keep a value function for each individual state, a separate number for that. And so both of those are sort of very nice cases that we can handle exactly. And today we're going to talk about another, another approach that, unlike the two before, is not actually optimal. So this approach is not exact. Um, and there are approximations involved here, or rather, approximation is the wrong word. There's rather sort of suboptimality involved here. But nonetheless, it's an approach that works very well in practice, and it kind of brings together these, these notions we ha we've seen of um, optimization in control with the stochastic formulation. So we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about why it's necessary. Um, and then the, the big problem with MPC is that it can be quite slow. So it still involves essentially solving optimization problems every time you want to take an action, which is a lot slower than you know, multiplying a matrix as you do with LQR. And so we'll talk about some ways of speeding up MPC uh, in the second part of class. Just finishing up though, last time I, I ended with talking about MVPs and value iteration. So value iteration is how we compute the optimal policy in an MDP. And this is the optimal policy really taking into account all the noise all the stochasticity of the, of the dynamics, it accounts for all of that and is still able to do the optimal, take optimal actions. And the way it does that is by building this thing called the optimal value function, which essentially is a measure of how much cost you will incur if you act optimally at time t and then keep acting optimally from that time forward. And it builds this thing up through dynamic programming. Essentially, first computes the best thing to do the last time, then the best thing to do with the uh, second to last time, considering you do it's optimal the next time, etc. And builds it backwards like that. So that's, like I said, that, that's another case where we can actually solve exactly what we want to do um, with a dynamical system. Now, a few quick comments on MDPs. Um, it's important to know that MDPs are really only going to be tractable for a relatively small number of states and actions, right? Because when you, when you compute value iteration, you have to store this vector, really, j. And j here is going to be effectively stored as a vector, j sub t, which is the value function for time t. j t is really itself a vector in r to the n where for each state it stores the value of being in that state, which is sort of the cost you will incur if you start in that state and then do the best thing going forward. Now, this is a vector in Rn, and every time you move through the, through the um, algorithm here, you have to minimize over all actions u. So every time you do that, you have to sort of evaluate what's going to happen for each state if I take any action you know, what's, what's going to happen in my next states then. And that means, <clears throat> and, and the only way to minimize over u here really is just to check every single one and pick the minimum, right? U is, u is discrete, so we can't sort of minimize it as a convex program or anything like that. We have to just pick the best action that we, that we can out of all the possible actions. So <clears throat> this algorithm is really only going to be feasible when both n here and m, which is the size of u, are relatively small, which is the point where you can you know, store vectors like this in memory, and where you can efficiently compute the resulting values for all u 
and for all next states you could end up in. And that can be actually quite large, right? We're summing over all possible next states, computing what happens if you take that action, given that next state, sort of what happens down the road. And, and that can be very tricky if you do have a setting where n and m are very big. Now, the problem with this is that if you were applying an MDP to a continuous state system, the number of states you need typically will grow exponentially in the dimension of the system. Right? So suppose you have a one-dimensional system where your true state is something like this. This is, this is say, temperature. We're using our heat, room heating example. Temperature is our state here. And it really is a real valued quantity, right? It can range from, say, in a room, you know, negative, negative 60 degrees to 80 or something in the summer, maybe it'll be. Right, so, so we want to try to, and, and actually even assume, I'm willing to even admit that it might be bounded. So we're, we're going to put absolute caps on how big we allow the temperature to be. We just will never allow it to get outside that range. Even if the state is bounded, this is a continuous state, right? So applying an MDP exactly doesn't really work here. So what you typically do is you chop the state into some number of divisions, and then have each one of these be its own state. And you compute the approximate dynamics for x in that bin, or that bucket there, right? Now, first of all, this is an approximation, because the dynamics, you know, the, the next state that you are going to end up with, if you take a certain action, and um, or, you know, your true temperature is here, is different from if your true temperature is here. But they're not that different. And you know, maybe both times, if you have heat on, you'll end up in this state, or if you have the heat off, you'll end up in that state. And typically, because we can express kind of stochasticity in these domains, what you could do is, you know, maybe if you really end up over here at this state, and you really just stay in this bucket when you start at that state, for example, say with the heater on, um, then we can just sort of represent it as a probability, where in that state there's some probability that you'll end up here, versus some probability you'll stay in the, in the state itself. As I said, that's a pretty good approximation to kind of the continuous dynamics of the real system. But now, con but now consider what happens if you have you know, not just one room, right, but several rooms. So you have um, temperature for room one here, and temperature for room two here. Well now, to represent what state the system is in, you really need to take all the cross products you can possibly be in, right? You have to sort of look at all the spaces here and all the spaces here. I'll just draw them like a grid. Okay? And so now you don't just need, you know, some division of, of uh, your range, say, if, if, if you want to divide this up into d different bins, say, per dimension. Now you actually need d squared states, right? So n would equal here d squared, um, where d is number of bins per dimension. Right? And you can always reduce the number d, maybe, to make this more tractable. But then you're sort of getting fuzzier and fuzzier approximations to, to your dynamics. And as you sort of discretize in bigger and bigger chunks, it's going to be less and less accurate description of the tree system. And so as you can imagine, this, this is always going to be, if you have, maybe I'm, I'm using weird notation here, because n in the MDP case refers to the number of states, and n refers to the dimensionality of the system usually. But I guess I'll read something like this. You know, n or the MDP equals D, the number of things you're trying, the number of bins you use per state, to the N, where N is the dimension of the actual state space, the, the sort of underlying continuous state space. Okay, so this is sort of very bad scaling. And this is an effect, and you, you, you see this before, you saw this before with radial basis functions, for example, in, um, in machine learning, right, when we talked about if you want enough features to cover a space so that you have an individual feature for every possible point in that space, like with a radial basis function that, you know, grow, that, that, that has an individual point over every single dimension, 
then you have the same kind of effect here. And, and, and this, this, this is an effect that's in, in general called the curve dimensionality. It means that the amount of memory and space you need, and computation, by the way, too, because you have to iterate over all these things, of course, when you, when you use the algorithm, um, that those quantities grow exponentially in the dimension of the state space and the action space, too, I should say, because you have to also discretize the actions in a similar way. Okay, so MDPs do sometimes apply very well to some small domains. Sometimes there really is a discrete state to the system. You know, there's not, can you say, there really is genuinely, the system can be one of n different discrete states. Maybe n's pretty small in some cases. In which case, you can apply these things. These things, these things do apply very easily. Um, but in general, it can be very hard to apply MDPs to kind of general high dimensional state spaces because you have to discretize in this really kind of fine grained manner in order to really preserve any kind of optimality for your control procedure. Now, there's one more point I want to make. There are approximate ways of dealing with this. All right, so just like in machine learning, we didn't let the fact that real basis functions had to be, you know, that there's an exponential number in the dimension of the input, we didn't let that stop us from considering high dimensional inputs. We just considered simpler function approximations, right? We considered, you know, linear function approximations that were linear in some features of the state. You can similarly try to approximate value functions. So remember, the thing we have to store for every state is this value function here. You can approximate those things as well with simpler functions. So you can approximate them with linear functions or with, you can use kernels too. You can do all these things that we do with machine learning to solve the same problems here. Um, but for some reason historically, I think I'm, okay saying this even on, on film, um, these haven't quite worked as well in the setting of approximate dynamic programming as they have in machine learning. And machine learning function approximation has been wildly successful. Um, and, and I think some of that aspect is that sometimes the thing you're trying to approximate, the output you're trying to approximate is fundamentally kind of simple. Uh, even though you have maybe a lot of features to predict it, your output is maybe only dependent on a few of them or maybe has a lot of regularity in it. Value functions are a pretty complex relationship here, right? They're, they're sort of involve minimization and a sum over an expectation, essentially. Um, and so because of that, they tend to be a little bit harder to approximate. I'm talking sort of very, kind of very broad terms here. But they tend to be harder to approximate. And because of this, there, I think, is okay to say that there has been less success applying really large scale, high dimensional, type state spaces to the approximate MDP setting as there have been in machine learning. There have been certainly some successes, some very, very famous successes, um, but some have been, they've been a little bit harder to come by. The last thing I want to add is that in the LQG, the linear quadratic Gaussian setting, remember, um, I also said something about um, the optimality in partially observable systems. So what I said was that even if you have partial observability in a linear quadratic Gaussian system, you can still do the optimal thing. And the optimal thing is you estimate the current state with a Kalman filter, which is essentially a fancy least squares method that takes all your past measurements and estimates your current state based on this. Then you take that estimate of the current state and you plug it into an LQR controller. And actually that seems kind of intuitive, right? It's sort of what you want to do. You take the best estimate of the state and, and you do what you think based upon that. Um, but the fact that that is optimal for linear quadratic systems is very, very unusual. So for example, in the MDP, if you also have partial observability, so if you don't observe the true state you're in, but only some function of the true state, or maybe you observe some observation with certain probabilities given what your current state is, this is a setting known as a partially observable MDP, or a POMDP. And those are much, much harder to do, to, to deal with, than MDPs. They're actually NP-hard to solve, if you're familiar with the computational complexity 
terminology like that. And the reason for this fundamentally is this principle that we had for linear quadratic systems, which I call the separation principle, meaning that you can sort of separate out the estimation task and the control task. That doesn't hold for an MDP. So in a POMDP, you still can do, you still can perform kind of the analog of a Kalman filter, which is essentially, given all you've seen so far, find the most likely state I'm in, or find the distribution over states I think I'm in. You can do that. But then the action where you say, okay, you know, given my belief, take kind of the best expected action according to my awesome policy for the MDP, if, as if I could observe everything, that combination is no longer optimal anymore. And we, won't go, won't, we won't go into why exactly this, this course really isn't, isn't about MDPs and stuff like this, but um, it's important to know that that is no longer, you can't do it in the MDP setting anymore. You need something much more powerful for this to work in an MDP setting, in the POMDP setting, rather. Okay, so that, that's all I wanted to say about MDPs. They're, they're sort of a, they're an important class of stochastic systems that you can solve exactly, but this class really doesn't focus on them. We focus much more on optimization and control of continuous systems based upon an optimization framework. Okay, so let's, are there any questions about MDPs here? Okay, so given that, let's move on to model predictive control. And the basic question for MPC is how can we use, remember, I set up a lot of the paradigm for control in this class as control as an optimization problem. Right? I sort of frame control as minimize some sum of costs given the current state and given the, the dynamics of the system. The question is, and, and that worked pretty well when we had deterministic systems, right? Because we could analytically say what our next state was going to be given our current state. So we can actually, it's a well-defined optimization problem, sort of given this, these, the dynamics just define constraints in the state. Sometimes we can't solve it because sometimes it's, you know, non-linear, the, the dynamics are non-linear, so it can be hard to solve, but it's still a well-defined problem. The trouble when you introduce stochasticity into the mix is that this becomes not really a well-defined problem anymore. So remember, our sort of general optimal control framework was something like this. We wanted to minimize over our actions and over our states, but really these are just variables that are going to be constrained by our constraints. The sum of the costs, x, t, u, t, subject to, well, we have the fact that x, t plus 1 equals f, x, t plus u, t, and then x, 1 equals some x in it. So that was our general optimal control setting. But now what happens when we have the dynamics with noise? x t plus 1 equals f of x t plus u t plus epsilon t. Well, now this doesn't really work anymore, right? Because now this constraint here isn't really a constraint at all. I mean, we don't know what our next state's going to be. We know what is an expectation, but that's not the same as knowing what it's going to be absolutely. And so, in fact, the only thing we can do to solve this exactly would be to actually come up with, as I said before, I sort of, this is as an idea, I didn't dive into it much, but what we can do is keep at every time a distribution over all our possible states. That becomes a new infinite dimensional variable, by the way. Our constraints, so maybe I could write something like this, right? I could write something like we want to minimize over this and the probability of this thing, and then something like expected value, where we hit expectations over our state at time t of that thing. Though also, of course, ut might also depend on the different states we get in, right? We can actually make xt a function of this probability distribution, or ut a function of this distribution here. Um, and then you have something, rather than this, you have something like the probability 
of this equals some function of this, you know, plus epsilon. This, this is kind of bad notation here because I'm switching between probabilities and, and functions here, but you get the kind of the, the basic idea, right? You want to maintain your distribution over all possible states and have that be your, your variable. Which is actually not unsimilar to what an MDP does. Um, an MDP has this, in this case, a value function, not a distribution of states, but has a value function that you explicitly maintain over every single state. Every, and, and what that really is, is you know, there's, there's a different probability you can be in any given state, and so you have to sort of maintain this thing as you go forward. You can do a similar thing with, with MDPs um, in the exposition framework, though it actually becomes a lot, a lot trickier. Uh, it doesn't be, it's actually no longer a convex problem anymore. So it's really hard, essentially, to do this general formulation when you have, so ca or, or th this, I should say, this control formula, or this optimization formulation of control is very hard to do just intuitively when you have stochastic dynamics to your system. So the question is, what can we do? Well, the first thing we could do was sort of this, the simplest idea we have, right? Let's keep everything simple. And let's just ignore the fact that there's any noise at all. We do know the fact here. So, so, so our dynamics are like this, right? But we do know that epsilon t is zero mean. Okay, that means the expected value of this does equal that. So maybe we can just kind of do everything like we did before, but have expected values for states instead of their, their true distribution over values. Maybe. That's exactly what, actually, that's, that is exactly what we did for LQR, um, but it still you have to sort of maintain a little bit of additional knowledge there. Um, so we can try this. Right? And I'm being a little bit informal here about what, what this means exactly. Uh, but basically, instead of xt being just the true states, it's some notion of the expected state you think you will be in. And this, at least for one time step, holds. Remember, our, our big point when we introduced stochastic, stochastic systems was that it did not hold for sequences of states, right? Because for sequences of states, this expectation breaks down. The nonlinear function there can, can corrupt that. So you don't have, in fact, the expectation of state x2 plus 2 equals expectations, you know, the, 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 all these things in expectation. You can't just put expectations inside of all of them. So this, this, this is sort of an approximation to the true dynamics here, but maybe it'll work out okay. So let's try that. It's sort of the, the, the dumb thing to do, right? We just solve the problem. What it boils down to, really, is that we solve the problem exactly like we did before. Um, just ignoring stochasticity because it is zero mean, so maybe it'll work out okay. So here's what happens when we do that. Here, I'm going to our five gener generator system again. And you'll remember one of the advantages of this optimization formulation is you could also do things like put convex bounds on the constraints themselves. So in our example here, the system was linear, so actually we sort of had the nice effects here. Though even when it is all linear, even though LQR works, once you add constraints, you still don't have optimality. So actually, the, the, the optimization formulation still is not the optimal stochastic controller. I won't prove that, but it just is something that holds. Um, and so remember, our, our, our benefit here was that when this is linear, say for example, we still can do things like have you know, bounds, say, on the, on the controls, so say UT is less than or equal to some upper bound on u. Uh, maybe I'll make these not time dependent. So we have some extra constraint, like all our controls have to be bounded within some amount. And in fact, in this example, remember what we did was we bounded the generation of each generator we're controlling to be plus or minus 0.5 PUs uh, above or below its nominal power generation. So that, that's how we get this pattern like this, remember. And it gets kind of funny control, right? You sort of 
hit different boundaries and you hit other ones and you kind of move between them and settle to different levels. Now, if we do that, so what I'm solving here is this optimization problem. And what we get out of the optimization problem is both a sequence of controls to execute and the sequence of states it expects will happen when you execute those controls according to our model. And according to our model here, without any noise in it. So here's what it thinks happens. Okay, so that's the controls that it ex outputs. And here is what it thinks will happen. Here's the, which is both what you get if you plug in those controls to this function here. It's, it's linear in this case, so we can, we can do that um, and still have it be all convex. And it's also, of course, these things are equivalent, the x t1 to t that you get out of the optimization problem itself. Okay, so it's both those things. Here's what we think will happen. But now the problem, of course, is that because this does not hold exactly, right, there's some noise in this that we don't know beforehand, but it's going to be some realization of noise when we actually execute it. What really happens is something more like this. Okay, so here is sort of, we're trying to regulate the generator angles around zero, remember? We, set, we, get, we input a sequence of control actions execute those blindly over 10 seconds, and what happens is something like this. And it's fairly intuitive what happened here too, right? Um, what happened was, well, this constraint does not hold exactly. Rather, it holds plus some epsilon t, which maybe an expectation is zero, but for any given time, it's not going to be zero. I mean, probably won't be zero, right? So for any given time, there's some noise to the system, and thus, we have actually this sort of bias term. I don't quite want to call it a bias term, actually. We have this x traditional term in our, in our dynamics that makes them evolve for any given realization of you know, what the actual noise terms are. It makes it evolve differently from how we expect it. So here's what we expect again, and here's what really happens. So what do we do? This seems kind of like it puts a damper on the whole notion of doing control via optimization. As I said, the right thing to do is maintain a, distribu a full distribution over all possible states you could be in throughout all time. But let's do something simpler instead. What you notice here is that at the very, and sort of this is intuitive too, so at the very beginning of this sequence here, what actually happens actually is not that different from what we think happens, right? So if you just look at those, you know, the first bit here, those are pretty similar. It's sort of far down here that they really start to diverge. And that's very intuitive because in a very short time horizon, the noise might not be that big. So what we expect to happen, kind of with zero expected noise, isn't going to be that far off from what really happens. The fact that can really knock us off is that this noise keeps building up over time. Right, so we keep adding more and more noise as we execute every step in our dynamics. Um, and so to fix that, we take kind of an obvious idea. And that is, and this is, this is what MPC is, is that every time step, instead of just taking, you know, running optimization once at time one, and then just taking those actions, we actually at every time step re-optimize this problem using the x init that we actually observe rather than the one that we sort of expect to happen with there's, if there's no noise in our dynamics. So here's the basic, the basic procedure. To start with, so, so we repeat for times one to our actual time horizon of the control task. First, we observe what state we're in at, at xt. So we observe the system state xt. We then solve the optimization problem, and I'm putting a little tilde over x and u here, and I'm also using h instead of t. Uh, we'll see in a second that actually h and t can be different. Um, here, h would actually be, um, I guess it would be t minus, big t minus little t, 
right? Because we're optimizing up to time t, but we're starting at time, up to time big t, but we're starting at time little t. And so in this case, h here would actually be our horizon, naively, would be t, big t minus little t. So we optimize kind of over all the states and controls that we have left, which is 1 to h and 1 u, 1 to h. Then we just plug in exactly our dynamics here. I'll do it for the case of a linear system. You can approximate it again for nonlinear systems, but then you have to use not a convex program anymore, so you have to use some other techniques. You have here your dynamics, so for all tau, using tau because t sort of refers to the actual time of the system, and this is sort of the hypothetical MPC time, it will be denoted tau. So you have x t plus 1 equals a, or x tau plus 1 equals a x tau plus b u tau. So linear dynamics, we'll assume here. Of course, you can have affine dynamics too. The generators are affine, so it's a little different than this even. Then the, 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 the sort of initial state constraint, right? That x1 tilde equals whatever state we're actually in right then. You have also your bounds on the state and the control. And you solve this problem. And this problem will give you, every time you solve it, it will give you a sequence of states it expects, which we know are not the states that will actually happen if you take those actions, but it was what it expects given sort of assumed zero noise. And it gives you a sequence of controls, all the controls to execute. What we do then is we look at just the first of those controls. And this is kind of the important point. We don't look at all those controls. So here what happened is we executed all the controls and that was kind of our problem, right? We took all these things that sort of were, went from now to very far in the future and executed all of them. And noise built up a lot, so what we expected to happen in our optimization problem didn't actually happen. But the first action we can take is actually pretty reasonable still, right? Because it's just based on what we do, it's just based on what we do, you know, what our state really is right now, and then kind of guiding it towards where we want to be later on. So the last step in MPC is you execute ut, so for time, for the real time step t, you execute the first action, u tilde 1, that you found in your optimization problem. Now, importantly, this does not mean that you only have to optimize over effectively u tilde 1 or x tilde 1. It's still very important that you solve the optimization problem with the entire, to the entire horizon h, right? Because that's saying we're going to take an action, the first action is going to depend on not only where we are right now, but also where we want to be h time steps from now and everywhere in between. But then we're going to throw everything else away other than that first action we take. That's sort of the key point there. We, we solve it as if we were going to take all the steps, and we only take the first one. And then we let the system do whatever it wants to do, right? We, let, we sort of let it evolve how it, how it will, and then we observe the next state, and we repeat this whole process. And what this effectively does is it closes the loop in our control as optimization framework. Because we're using what we actually see, what actually happens to the system, xt is the true state, not our hypoth hypothetical state. We include what actually happened back into our control scheme. And as we'll see in a second, this makes it effectively work almost as well as, or in fact can work much better because it can take into account things like constraints. Um, this works similarly to LQR and other controllers, which Controllers like LQR, of course, naturally take into account what state you end up in, right? Because they are of the form, the ut equals k times xt, so they will actually adapt to whatever state you end up in. This is also effectively doing the same thing. But your function, and, and so in some sense, both of these things, both LQR and MPC, give you the control as some function of the state. Okay, so for LQR, it's just you just multiply it by a matrix. For MPC, well, ut is still some function of the current state, 
just a very complex function where that function involves actually solving an optimization problem to get out that solution. Right? So in both cases, we have sort of a controller that uses the current state to determine what the next action should be. It's just that this one involves an optimization problem, this one involves a matrix multiplication. So you can also imagine which one is simpler, right? It's a lot faster to multiply by a matrix than it is to solve a brand new optimization problem. Especially if you have to control these things, you know, hundreds of times per second, um, this could be pretty tough to do. Whereas this might work better. On the other hand, if you have lots of time between steps, like you're controlling, you know, over days how you're going to allocate power, you can nicely directly incorporate constraints into this one where you can't do that with this one. So that hopefully sort of demonstrates a little bit of the benefits and costs of each of these. So here's what happens with MPC. So what you'll see is that you, as you did with LQR, you have a policy that roughly controls the system to its desired point. Now, remember, LQR and MPC, for, for the stochastic case, both these things are never going to exactly get the system to its desired state, right? Because that once, even if you're at its zero state, the next time you won't be because there's some random noise you couldn't have possibly predicted. Okay? So we're, we're throwing out the hope of ever getting the system exactly to zero. I mean, you can get it pretty close by having really big control actions, but typically there is going to be a trade off between control and generation. Much, or, sorry, control and um, regulation, that's what I meant to say. So how, how close you can get to your optimal solution depends on how much sort of how much you're, you're willing to vary your control actions up and down from kind of what you expect them to be. And this was, was, this, this was also borne out in LQR, remember. So if we go back to LQR, you could get something like this about where our um, generators are relative to their desired state. With that control, you get a much closer with much noisier control. And the same thing, the same exact thing bears out in MPC. Um, by the way, the, the, the way you get these two different um, behaviors here is that, remember, one of the costs in LQR is this cost RU. And for this case, we have an affine system, so actually the, the, the cost is R delta U, where delta U is the difference between our kind of feed forward control that we think will maintain the system at that state given no noise, and our feedback control. So, so just emphasizing the point that, that u is not required to be zero, or uh, for each generator, u is not kind of being regularized towards zero. Rather, they sort of would take on this kind of average value, but it can take on other values uh, to essentially adjust for the noise that actually occurs. So the same thing happened in LQR, and the same thing happens in MPC if we skip forward, right? So what you see here is, I think actually this, I just happened to pick one that was kind of in between these two things. Um, I'm using the exact same cost here, by the way. So I'm using the same cost functions we have for LQR. Uh, the only difference with MPC is that we do have bounds. So you see these things actually limited. Even when you're, you're sort of at the system state that you want to be in, um, you still may kind of wander up a little bit, and you're still going to be clipped at that upper bound in that case. So um, this is what the resulting trajectories and control look like for MPC. We have some sort of deviation from our kind of smooth controls you would plan from just controls optimization. You have to because there's some noise that creates different variations than you would expect. Um, but like MPC, you have absolute bounds on how far you ever deviate from the desired control. Not just the penalty you pay as you do with LQR, but actual hard constraints here. So that's the basic idea of MPC. It's a really sort of, sort of simple algorithm. Um, and importantly, you know, it's, it's not optimal. Uh, and the second thing is that it can be pretty slow, too, right? Because, oh, so, so, so first of all, I guess it's I guess not optimal. Um, it's not exactly the, the optimal control strategy you would take if you're taking full stochasticity of the system into account. So if you really represent the system as a, as a stochastic system, uh, you have no choice you really want to solve it optimally, you have no choice but to represent 
the actual distribution of our states at all times. That's how you have to solve it. This is an approximation which works pretty well in practice because you know we're, we're essentially just like LQR works pretty well even without knowing what's going to happen in the future. Um, even if the you know, ideas, even if the assumption of LQR were perfectly satisfied, like maybe your noise wasn't exactly Gaussian, LQR can still work pretty well in, uh, in practice because it has this feedback element. So if we sort of drift away from the desired state, we kind of push ourselves back there a little bit, sort of like a PID control does, right? A PID control didn't have any notion of optimality, yet it kind of worked okay. MPC is a similar thing where it's not optimal really anymore, but if you get far away, it'll sort of plan a trajectory to get you back to where you want to be. You'll take the first bit of that and you'll see what happens next. And you'll keep doing this and that will tend to push you back toward where you want to be. So this feedback element can work very well in practice while, as I said, obeying those constraints that we have on our control. Now, a big problem here, admittedly, is this, this is not a simple task. Um, to compute this effective function for MPC requires we solve a big optimization problem every single time. So for example, in this last, ex in this last uh, plot here, the, I use an integration time step of 0.01. So there's 100 intervals per second of what happens here. That means that an optimal horizon of 10 seconds Right? And even using kind of my, I, I, I saw this before just as optimization or in the discrete time case using YALMAP and it took like a couple seconds. Um, I actually even went further and optimized it with uh, a solver called Cplex, which is sort of you know, a, a very fast for off the shelf software. It's a very fast solver. You're not going to get that much faster for QPs like this, quadratic programs like this. So even after I optimized as much as I could uh, for a time step of 0.05 seconds, or sorry, 0.01 seconds, optimizing for a horizon of 10 seconds, that's um, 100,000, sorry, no, 1,000 states, but then you have, um, you have a lot of states per thing, so you have 5,000, so it's like 2,700 states, right? That's a lot. Um, and, and that many variables in our, in our uh, optimization problem, it still takes about 0.25 seconds to compute the solution. But unfortunately, my actual integration time step that I was thinking about was 0 0.1, 0 0.01 seconds. Right? So I'm not even as fast as real time. So if I wanted to actually control a system like this, I couldn't even do it. Because by the time I had solved the problem, the system would have moved further forward than you know, I had actually planned for. So this, this seems like a problem, right? Even, and, and I should say, this is a, you know, five generators, that's tiny, right? There's many more generators in the actual grid. Um, how do you actually go about applying this in practice? Well, first of all, I should say that, that as I said before, the first thing you might want to do is just forego using MPC at a, as a, a, at a, for a problem where the time step is this small. So for something like scheduling generation over you know, days, where you're looking at really more the economic dispatch problem, minimizing cost, sort of the optimal power flow problem with time constraints. When you look at that, you're talking about you know, maybe, maybe taking one action per hour. This could work great. Maybe you don't care that it takes an hour between, you know, it takes 0.25 seconds between things, if you're you know, waiting an hour between what you, what you actually do, that's probably fine. So it could be that for some problems, and I'll really admit this, that for some problems MPC really isn't that well suited. This, the number of tasks where it can be applied though is increasing a lot, just because computational power is speeding up. Um, a decade ago, MPC was sort of unthinkable for any kind of real-time control task. Now it's used there all the time. Maybe two decades ago it was unthinkable for that. Now it's used there all the time. Okay, so there is some sort of you know, natural progression of comp computing which will make this more applicable. Um, but even then, you know, 
if I have a system with 100 generators, for example, and said, I don't think I'm going to get this down to the right size that quickly. I just don't think it's going to really happen. So what do we do? So what I'll, I'll, what I'll finish up with for today is some methods for speeding up MPC and making it more practical for real situations. So the first one is that, and I'll, and I'll write down kind of the basic MPC algorithm here to have it in mind. So remember, our first thing was we observe xt and we solve the optimization problem, minimize over x tilde, 1 to t, or 1 to h rather, u tilde, 1 to h, sum tau equals 1 to h, cos x tau, u tau, subject to, I'll write the sort of general case here, but for a linear system, this would be make it all convex. Or an affine system would still be convex. Oops, equals. And then x tilde 1 equals xt, where xt is the actual state here. And then finally, we take action u tilde 1. Okay, so here's the first point. There really are two effective horizons we care about, time periods we care about, when we have a control task like this. Right, remember, we're, we're doing this whole thing for one, two, big T, for one to big T. Right? And big T is the time horizon we actually care about in our control task. And that can be a really long time, right? Because maybe we care about regulating the system for days. Um, we want the system to be, you know, stay around. We probably actually want it to stay around the right part, part forever, in theory, right? So in theory, actually, big T is, is infinite, because we want to continue this process forever. So really, we care about kind of the sum of infinite number of costs. And, and LQR actually worked for the infinite time horizon thing, so that actually was fine. In MPC, we can't do that because we can't actually store an infinite number of, of data points. But the big point here is, that, and, and, and what I sort of said was that, well, we could pick h t to be equal to t minus little t, meaning that wherever we are right now, we schedule what to do for the rest of time till the end. Okay, but this, while it's sort of the right thing to do in some sense, often isn't really necessary. And here's the intuition. If you're trying to regulate generators around you know, some desired point, some desired angles for all of them, I probably don't really care where they're going to be tomorrow. You know, and, and, and if I'm able to reach that desired point in you know, maybe 10 seconds or so, I probably don't really care you know, what they're going to look like tomorrow. Right? 24 hours from now, if it takes me about 10 seconds to get them to where I want them to be. So there's no need to take our horizon, for our planning horizon here in MPC, to be the same, to be this actual equation here. That says that we sort of care about the rest of time up until whenever. There's no real need for that. Um, MPC can work very well if you take H to be some much shorter and even fixed time horizon. If it's too short, you have this problem where you're not looking far enough ahead, certainly. I mean, that was sort of the point of control, is that we don't want to just optimize, say, if you take h equals 2 or 1. Um, you're not going to take any actions that sort of gear you, uh, steer you towards wh where you want to be in the long term. you are just take kind of greedy actions right now. But if h is long enough, such that it is, and, and long enough is very kind of problem specific here, certainly. Uh, it's very dependent on the particular problem. If h is long enough such that it kind of looks far forward enough, right, then this can still work pretty well even if h is much smaller than t minus, the big t minus little t. And of course, 
by doing this, we can greatly reduce the amount of computation we do, right? Because we can go from needing a whole, needing a really, really big optimization problem here to needing a much smaller one to solve only some finite, solve these pro problems only for some finite time into the future. Okay, so here's what it looks like. So here is our control law. If we take h to be equal to 10 seconds, and I'm actually having it be 10 seconds, but then I'm also clipping it to be the maximum, so I'm, you know, once I'm, once I'm at the end, it doesn't you need to take more than 10 seconds after you reach time t. But you still can, by the way. You could optimize, you know, past your time horizon t if you want to. There's nothing stopping you from doing that either. So here's what it looks like if I take my time horizon to be 10 seconds. That's as long as my actual, what I'm plotting here, and just for the sake of this argument, we'll say it's as long as we care about. I don't know why you care about me for 10 seconds, but say we do here. If I do the exact same thing with my horizon being 2 seconds, I get this. Now, even in 2 seconds, no, no, we're not actually reaching our optimum in 2 seconds. So it's not like this is enough to actually get there, even here. But it still works really, really well. I think you'd have to squint. I, I can't see the difference between those two graphs, for example. Um, I think if there is some, it probably just has to do with random noise more than the actual control law they apply. I actually might even fix the random noise sequence though. So these look actually pretty much identical to me. I don't see any differences. Maybe there's like a slight, I'm looking for like little patterns, they look a little different. Maybe there's a slight difference there, but they're <laughs> for all intents and purposes identical. Okay? And that is with only optimizing two seconds ahead instead of all ten. So we've shaved off, you know, 80% of our computation and it looks exactly the same. Of course, how short you can go is going to be very problem dependent. So here's if I start going shorter, here's what happens. So this is h of 0.05. That still maybe is okay. It sort of looks all right. Um, that one doesn't look too different. It's take, actually, it's not really getting to zero. So I'm kind of staying, maybe I'm taking actions that are too, that are too small. I'm not really driving it. I'm not looking far enough ahead to really drive to zero. But it, maybe it still is kind of okay. Um, but you see sort of real problems develop when you get too, too short. So this is h of 0.1. And what happens here is that 0.1 seconds for this problem is just far too short a time period, at least also given the cost that we have, is far too short a time period to really be able to do much to the system in that amount of time. You can't just, you can't get it very far unless you're willing to take huge actions, which we don't have available here in this MBC uh, framework. So we have, you know, a limit on how big our actions can be, and so it's going to take us a long time to get to the end. Or rather, it, sorry, it will take us more than 0.1 seconds to get anywhere where we can actually control the system in any meaningful way. So what happens is, I mean, it, it isn't horrible, actually, sort of almost surprisingly, right? It's actually not the worst thing you could do here. Um, but it's not really going to control the system in the proper way. No. So of course, that's also you know, 1 100th of the computation. And it, as you might expect, it turns out that sort of the, the right place to be is typically some balance in between those two. So you want some amount of, you want to look far enough ahead that what you do will sort of be thinking about the long-term consequences of your actions, but there is a point in which looking further ahead will not actually change what you do. You will do the exact same thing whether you look forward 10 seconds or a day. So don't look forward a day. Okay, so that's, that's one. Were there any questions about, about this one? Okay, the second thing is sort of similar, um, but it's a slightly different point. In MPC, so the, so the first thing we could do was shorter time horizon h. The second thing we can do is to update this whole thing less frequently. So a big problem with MPC, what, what reason why it's so slow, is that we are solving this optimization problem very, very frequently, then taking only the first action that we, that we get out here. That's very time consuming, of course, because, well, it's solving an optimization problem to get there. <laughs> 
and you're doing all that work for only one action, only one control. And if, by the way, if your time has passed in that time point, you're not really, you've already missed your chance in some sense, maybe. So the second thing we can do is the idea here, well, backing up for a second, the idea of MPC in general was that we wanted to take into account how what was really happening was different from what we expected to happen due to this noise, right? But in the very short term, so my time up here is 0.01 seconds, in the course of 0.1 seconds, say, the amount of noise that will actually build up in the system is pretty small. So we're not actually going to go that far off from where we thought we would be, probably. So basically, you know, our x, our hallucinated x tilde, to be the first maybe k of these, say, where k is like 10 or 20 or so, is not going to be that different from what really evolves. So rather than just taking the first action here and doing this every single time, you can do this only every, say, k time steps. So maybe sort of, I'll write it like this, you know, if t, if mod t, k equals zero, so if k is some number, say 20, and if k divides t evenly, then you do this, and rather than taking every single, only the first action, you actually take all the actions, you, your hallucinated, act, or you know, your, your planned actions, from now to step k. With the intuition being that in k time steps, your hallucinated state here won't differ that much from the true state. It will somewhat, certainly, but not that much, maybe. And again, the idea here is that over a short time horizon, the effects of stochasticity are not that bad. They're somewhat small. So you're not going to build up huge error. Okay, so here is a plot of, of these things. And again, the top plot is updating every 0.01 seconds. That's every single time step we take in the, in the integration time step. Um, it also kind of speaks to the fact that our integration time step was somewhat arbitrary here, right? I mean, why did we choose 0 0.01? Well, you know, that's just what I chose is my delta t. I could choose anything. We probably don't need to pick, you know, our optimization problem entirely dependent, don't make it entirely dependent on whatever I pick for my integration time step. Um, so what I'm showing here on the second plot is if we do the updating of MPC only every 10 time steps. So in other words, we have a, we update the MPC solution every 0.1 seconds instead of every 0.01 seconds. And again, as with the first plot with the different horizons, um, they, there's hard to tell the difference between these two, right? Effectively, taking 10 steps, so one, taking actions 1 to 10 is, looks identical to taking actions 1 to t. Despite the fact that that's you know, a whole lot, you have a whole lot less. Taking, you know, you're feeding back your state a whole lot less then. As with the shorter time horizon though, you can kind of start taking this too far. So if we start updating every 0.05 seconds, well that actually looks pretty good. Um, if you do every two seconds, well now you get back to start getting back to the same situation we had with this optimization control in the first place, right? Where our state starts to diverge too much from what we expected and so you get this very weird behavior where things just kind of float around where they want to be, they don't actually ever reach it. Or you don't feed back often enough to actually regulate your state where you want it to be. So the second thing was essentially uh, less frequent Now by combining both those two things, I and mean, what we saw, right, was that, okay, maybe we can take updates every 0.5 seconds. That's, that, that's a 50-fold decrease in computation. By using a horizon of, of 0.2, we can get 
20%, I guess a, a five-fold decrease in computation. So by doing all this stuff, as, as you might imagine, we actually can get a system where we can solve it in real time. So I think for, uh, on my desktop here, I can take a horizon of two seconds, update every 0.1 seconds, and then to solve it in my oxidation solver takes now about 0.08 seconds. I've reduced it now, so I've reduced it tenfold with the different updating, I've reduced it uh, fivefold with the horizon. That makes the computation a lot less than it was originally. And because of that, I can get it down to taking uh, 0 0.08 seconds to solve the optimization problem, this one right here. And we need to sort of resolve it every 0.1 seconds. So this is now at least able to keep up with real time. Basically, by the time I solved it, and I, it's sort of weird because I've moved over, I've moved on a little bit, right? So I sort of, I'm still taking these actions, but I've moved on a little bit from now. So maybe I don't take quite like the first K, I take, you know, the K8 to K plus 8 or something like that. But still, I can kind of keep up with the system in real time. As long as I can solve things faster, then it sort of gives me new, new states. So that's good. We now have an MPC system that even for a pretty high frequency control task like this, still looks reasonable. Of course, this is still relatively simple, this task. I have to say, right? It's still five genders we're talking about, controlling them to regulate their angle at around a given point. It's not a very hard control task. Um, and so even 0 0.08 seconds seems like a lot of time to solve that one. It's a pretty simple task. So, again, there are pluses and minuses here. Um, MPC, as I was saying before, it finds most of the applications in times where there are larger time sets between different actions. So, you know, where you take a new action every hour, every 15 minutes. Then it makes perfect sense, right? Because then you have a lot of time to sort of spend doing computation to find the best thing you can do in that next 15 minutes or hour. If you have systems that sort of change really, really fast, it might be less applicable. But having said that, there are a lot of cases where this works a lot better than LQR. And so if you can develop a solver that will actually solve this problem fast enough to keep up with real time, maybe you really do want to go with that instead of going with your more you know, traditional control law like PID control or LQR. So the Third, or rather the, the bonus question on the homework, um, that covers essentially an optimization formulation of planning for a smart grid domain where you have some storage, some wind power, some generation you can control, stuff like this. Um, and you can apply exactly that kind of stuff in an PC framework to figure out what to do not just now, but you know, all times as you, go, as you go forward in the future. And so that's where this, sort of this kind of stuff can play a big role because then that's what we're talking about planning every hour or so. And maybe that's where this stuff really makes a lot of sense to do. At 0.01 seconds, maybe it does. I know people actually talk about doing even faster than this. So, so because you, so, so for small enough problems like this, if you reduce your horizon enough, maybe you, you have a, non, you know, a pretty simple control task where you don't have, a, have to have that long a horizon, um, you can only look, you know, taking actions every so often. You can basically, you can make this problem pretty small in some cases. In those cases, you can actually develop kind of specialized code just to solve that problem, which can be very fast, you know, on the order of, of milliseconds or microseconds even. Um, in which case, it actually can make sense to do this for even very sort of high frequency tasks where you have to change a lot. Um, so actually one of, the, one of the most interesting current directions, I think, in control is exactly this, finding domains where you can do MPC at extremely high frequencies to get this kind of control, optimization-based control, in a framework where typically that wouldn't have been imagined 10 years ago. Yeah. That MPC was for you know, controlling big factories, maybe, not for controlling like a little uh, robot or something like that, or not for controlling generators in a grid. It was for you know, doing dispatch, but not for real-time control. But it's becoming more and more applicable to real-time control uh, every sort of every day, every year. 
All right. Um, I, oh, I guess so I, yeah, I forgot I had a slide here. So, 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 so I guess this was what I was getting to before. Um, the third, obviously, we can speak that is just to optimize faster, right? I use Cplex. That is faster than YALMIP. YALMIP wouldn't have solved this because it would spend a little bit of time parsing and everything like that. Um, and so that actually was, would be a little slower. Um, if you can put the problem in the standard form and directly use a specialized solver or an off-the-shelf solver like Cplex, that can be a lot faster. As I said before, even faster than that is if you develop custom code to solve just this one problem. You can do that too. So you're essentially using the same techniques that these general purpose quadratic programming solvers and linear programming solvers use. Um, but you can do it with a lot of sort of tricks that can make it faster. For example, something that happens in MPC a lot is that, or in optimization, even convex optimization, which has a global solution, a big task in optimization is to figure out a starting point you can start from. So you get next to where you, know, where you basically start from in order to get subsequent solutions. Uh, typically optimization procedures are iterative, so they start at one point and then slowly have to get better. So if you give it a good initial starting point, this can work much better than if you get a bad initial starting point. Now, a common thing to do for your starting point is to take the solution of the previous optimization problem and use that to initialize your next solution, right? Because that was sort of what you would have done had you just executed stuff blindly. Or, or say, you know, you take uh, x tilde or u tilde um, 2 to h and then maybe repeat the last action or something like that. So u tilde 2 to the h and then h u h again as your initial guess for what you want to do at time 2. Right? Because that's sort of what you thought you were going to do. It's probably going to be something similar to you. It'll be a little different because this will not be quite what you hypothesized your state would be. But if this is kind of small, that's a pretty good starting point for how you want to initialize these things. So that's one simple kind of optimization procedure you can, you can take into account. You can also do things, as I said, um, like create custom code just to solve this one problem here. And there's some really cool work on essentially it's code generation. So you, so you give it just a description of the problem and it will this, this program will actually generate another program which is meant to solve just this one instance of an optimization problem. And that can be applied, that, that can work really, really fast and it can be applied really nicely to these kind of domains where say maybe you want to solve this thing on an embedded processor. So you want to develop some small piece of code that's sort of self-contained that will solve just this one problem. There's some, there's some very interesting work on, on doing exactly that. Okay, so that is basically all I have for control. I have two slides at the very end of this and then we'll, then we'll be done for the day. Um, but one thing I want to mention uh, through all of this is that the dynamics that we, we so, so sort of an overriding assumption in a lot of this unit on control in general was that we had dynamics you know, of the form xt equals f xt plus 1 equals f of xt ut or even for a linear case xt plus 1 equals a xt plus b ut. And a lot of these things, basically everything except PID control, uh, assumed that we knew what these say a and b were. So for LQR, you have to plug a and b into that LQR command in MATLAB in order to get a controller out. Um, for MPC, you have to put these two matrices into the optimization problem itself for it to, be to, for it to solve itself. Um, and they all require that we actually know what they are. Right? But in practice, there are a lot of cases. Say if you, you, know, you want to heat a room, um, we talked about how that sort of is based upon physical laws. That's true. Uh, but I don't know if that's always the best way to, you know, Physical laws can be complex even for a single room. I mean, this room has, you know, I don't know what the thermal properties are between the window and the inside here. You know, I don't know exactly what the thermal gradient is, or uh, not the gradient, what exactly the conductivity essentially is between the uh, outside and the inside here. So it could be pretty complex to kind of, you know, open a book of physics, figure out the exact properties of that glass, all these kind of things to get a precise model of this room. Just again, from first principles. So this is sort of where, and, and, and that is required in order to apply these, you know, some description of the room is required in order to apply these methods. So this is again where things like machine learning can come in. And 
the integration of machine learning and control is, I think, one of those sort of the, the most exciting areas of research right now. What happens when you have systems that are always learning new models of the world and trying to control them simultaneously? So in the case of this, I'll just talk about linear systems right now. Suppose that we believe our system to be linear or, approximate, or approximately linear. Um, but we don't know what A and B are. Well, what I've said sort of is that this is a machine learning problem. But I just want to formalize what that is exactly. Um, and what I mean by that is we can observe a bunch of times where we see the next state and the previous state and previous control. So we have a bunch of pairs like this. And in machine learning context, this essentially is the outputs. And these here are the inputs. Um, apologies for using x twice here and y for something that's different. I'm trying to, again, merge between the machine learning and the control notation. Um, now, the one difference here is that, from what we saw typically, is that y itself is a vector in Rn. It's not a single quantity anymore. It's a vector. So we need predictions a little bit different than what we saw before. But actually what we can do is just take each element of y individually and frame this as a machine learning problem. So what we might have is we might have you know, y, or rather y equal to xt plus 1. Um, I shouldn't say that this is for a lot of t. Right? This is your t for 1 to some big t. And we have the next one, the current, the next state, current state, and current action for all these t's. So y could essentially be the, you know, for one task, y could be the ith element of our state, the next state. x could be all of our current state and current control. Maybe I'll write it like this, actually. E, U, T. And now this is just a linear prediction problem. If, if, if we want to find a linear A and B to do this, this is exactly a linear prediction problem here. This is exactly the least squares problem, where our phi actually, in this case, just is this thing. It is just U, T, and it is just X, which is U, T, and, or X, T, and U, T. And our output Y is X, T plus 1, the ith element of that. So, a little more details here. Remember, what we can do is we can co compute a, or we can observe some sequence of controls and, and states. We can get that anywhere we want. Maybe, maybe we start with a PID controller or something like that, right? That sort of does OK, um, but generates enough data such that we can learn a model of the system. So we start with some data like this. We find A and B that minimize this thing here, which this thing is now a sum of loss functions. I'm actually writing right now sort of the machine learning problem for minimizing all these tasks simultaneously effectively. So we're actually looking at all the y's at the same time. That's actually equivalent to looking at all them, of them individually and just concatenating the answer together. We can also use other loss functions instead of least squares loss there. We can actually use uh, L1 loss, whatever we want, um, to get different estimates of, of these A and B matrices. And um, this, at least if we use the L2 loss, this is a linear least squares problem. We know exactly how to solve it. It just involves a, basically, you form a big matrix of all these guys. You do phi transpose phi inverse phi transpose y. Um, and that will give you the solution. That will give you A and B. Now, one big point here. If the system really is linear, this will work very well. If the system is really linear, then, and maybe with some noise, for example, then all your data will sort of come from the same linear model plus some noise. And they can kind of be all over the place, but you still can kind of do OK. Or, or sorry, regardless of, so, so actually, let, let, me, let me sort of draw this picture here. A few minutes we have left. So if your data is really linear, I'm going to draw it like this. So our output, which is, again, think of x t plus 1 here, and x, say it lies approximately on a line. 
if it really is linear, then it doesn't really matter where you get data from. So I'm going to have a few points over here and a lot of points over here. And least squares will sort of fit, no matter what you do, it'll sort of fit this line pretty well. So it'll, it'll do a line. Um, if you have a situation like this, though, where your system is not linear, then a quick point here is that it really doesn't matter now where you collect your data from and how you collect this data. Because if you have a lot of points over here, then what least squares will do is actually fit a model kind of like this. Because this fits this data really well. It makes mistakes here, but you only pay for it you know, three times. Whereas you get a lot of benefit over there. But then if you end up taking control actions that sort of put you over here, this is maybe the best place to be in your system, you just ended up over here in your training set, um, that really can be nasty. Because now you've basically ended up in some place where your model is completely wrong. So this is actually one of the most kind of subtle but hardest points about this iterated learning and controlling framework is that where you get your states from matters and that can greatly affect both what you do next time, so sort of where your controller sends you in, in, in state space, um, and it can easily send you to some place where your model is actually very bad. So it's easy to kind of get caught in some bad behavior here where you do something that looks good, but that sends you to a place where your model is actually very bad. Okay, so this is actually the end of our official units here in this course, the three units. Uh, so we're finishing up control now. Uh, I'll ask if there are any questions, but people have, I know people are probably in to, to, to go. The next few lectures are kind of beco kind of becoming special topics. So, so we'll have kind of special things. Um, there's also, we'll have sessions for you know, asking questions about the homework and stuff like that too, if people are, are curious. Um, but mainly we're going to be talking about kind of topics that come from here and there. We have four lectures left, I believe. So we'll sort of have one, and then we have a final lecture on the last day of class too that sort of wraps up a lot of this and talks about some future directions. So, um, okay, are there any questions quickly in the negative one minute we have left? See everyone next time.